Hello, I am Matt Butcher. I'm the CEO of Fermion. Uh, we're building the next wave of cloud computing and we're doing this with WebAssembly. So I'm really excited today because what we're gonna talk about is frictionless cloud application development with WebAssembly. Here's kind of what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna start by talking about what WebAssembly is and why we at Fermion think that it brings something really important to the cloud. From there, we're gonna talk about serverless and the promise of serverless and where we think it might have faltered and why we think WebAssembly really gets it back on track and realizes that promise. And then we're gonna go a little bit practical. We're gonna look at Fermion platform and how you can run that on DigitalOcean and how you can build a spin WebAssembly application and deploy it. And then I'm looking forward to the end because I like talking about the numbers. I think WebAssembly, uh, it's a cool technology from the developer experience side, but it's also a cool one because the cloud savings using it is really impressive. So with that, let's talk about WebAssembly a little bit. So I know some of you are probably familiar with WebAssembly from the browser world. Uh, when Luke Wagner first wrote his blog post in May of like, I don't know, June of like 2015 or something, uh, he described it this way. He said, WebAssembly defines a portable size and load time efficient format. So that's a bytecode format and an execution model specifically designed to serve as a compilation target for the web. So what does he mean by this? Well, he meant what they were trying to enable was developers to bring their own programming languages, their preferred programming languages to use side by side with JavaScript in the web browser. So for example, you could use C or Rust and compile it to WebAssembly or uh, you know Python or Ruby or languages like that and run them side by side with JavaScript. Now, WebAssembly has some really unique uh, constraints. It has a very nice security sandbox. It has a lot of uh, ways to easily import and export functions. And so uh, you know it has some compelling use cases maybe beyond the browser. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. So my team, uh, the Fermion team, when we first got started, the, the 10 of us who are founders of Fermion, we had been working in the container landscape for a long time, and we were very familiar with cloud computing. Uh, we built Helm, we built Brigade, we built a whole bunch of projects like that that were very oriented around Kubernetes and containers. And the way we were thinking about compute was like this. There are really two classes of cloud compute. There are virtual machines and there are containers. So what are virtual machines and what do they offer? Well, a virtual machine you know, is, is kind of the big workhorse of the cloud, right? They're highly secure. You really package everything up from the kernel and the drivers through the utilities and the libraries and the file system all the way up to your application. Good effort into building a really developer oriented virtual machine environment is DigitalOcean. Uh, but the thing for us that we really want is that virtual machines take quite a while to start. We're talking about minutes to go from, you know, booting the thing up to when your application code is actually running. So along come a second class of cloud computing, containers. And containers are sort of like the middleweight class, right? They're, they're medium security. You still have a slightly larger attack surface than you would with a virtual machine. But, and that's because of, because of the shared kernel space, right? But your packages are a lot smaller. You're really only packaging up the core libraries you need, the file system, your application code, any supporting files. And so they're a lot easier to move around. Thanks to Docker, it's a lot more developer friendly to build containers. You just write your Docker file and have that package everything up for you. But when it came to start time, the start time is definitely not minutes, right? It's seconds in most cases. And we wanted to call that sort of like the, the fast one, but we knew that in compute time, you know, startup in seconds isn't really fast. And that's what really kind of got us clued into this idea that maybe there was a third kind of cloud compute that we should look for and develop. So as we got looking around and saying, okay, if we've got a, a, a heavyweight and a middleweight class, what would be the lightweight class? We looked around at a number of technologies and WebAssembly really came to the foreground because a lot of those features that make it a compelling browser model make it a compelling cloud compute layer as well. For example, the security model for WebAssembly was designed uh, with a sandbox in mind where the sandbox is actually stricter than the JavaScript sandbox. So, you know, the early evidence suggests that, that the WebAssembly sandbox is actually a very high security environment. Instead of bringing, you know, the kernel to app code or the core libraries to app code, really, you're just bringing your application and the few supporting files that it might need. So it's a smaller package. Uh, originally, maybe WebAssembly wasn't tremendously developer friendly, but we realized very early on that we could tool around that. And so what you'll see today is a developer experience really 
very much informed by the success we've seen with containers and, and other kind of environments where developer experience is prioritized for cloud computing. But then finally, <clears throat> and this is the one that really got us excited, startup time for WebAssembly is not minutes, it's not seconds, it's milliseconds. In fact, these days we're talking about sub one millisecond from starting up the WebAssembly environment to getting the very first instruction of your code executing. And that is amazingly fast and actually opens up a whole bunch of new opportunities for us. So we kind of think of WebAssembly as that lightweight uh, third class of computing. Now, what do you do with WebAssembly, right? We had, we, had, we had landed on the compute layer. What problems does WebAssembly solve really well? One of the things that's been interesting to us and probably to many of us in this talk, right, has been the promise of serverless. And in particular, I'm thinking about serverless functions or FAS, right? Uh, serverless to us has not quite reached its potential. Uh, you know, we talk to lots and lots of developers and we talk to a lot of them about preferred programming models and, and how they like to code. And what we heard about serverless functions is that developers really like the fact that you can get started and you can just like dive right in to your application code right away. Like that's the first thing you do in serverless. You got this function wrapper and you just immediately start writing your business logic. But we also heard a number of things that they said they didn't like. Uh, vendor lock-in, that your languages were always uh, dictated by the cloud provider or providers, that there were tight restrictions on what you could do, that uh, the, the big ones really, that debugging was hard, deployment management was hard, and operations was difficult. And so we said, okay, well, there, we've learned two good things, right? Something that developers love and, and, and a number of things that they say, please don't do this if you want it to be successful. Uh, here's some areas for improvement. And we looked at WebAssembly and we went, yeah, actually, this is a really good fit. The WebAssembly model really kind of fits the things that developers are telling us that they want to be able to do and how they want to build it. We looked at the prevalence of microservices, in particular, kind of the standard stateless microservice pattern that we've seen, you know, plow its way through containers and Kubernetes and similar technologies. And we looked at where developers were telling us they would like that to be better. Uh, because what we really wanted to do was bring this sort of design model for serverless and be able to implement that very efficiently inside of a microservice architecture. So we realized that we could really strip out a lot of the boilerplate that you typically get with microservices, having to stand up an HTTP server, having to configure your TLS, having to manage all the process interaction. And we could say, look, we'll take a serverless pattern and we'll enable you to write microservices and web applications inside of WebAssembly. And that's really kind of the core thesis that got us building uh, Spin, our developer tool, and then Fermion Platform, the sort of uh, the thing that's running in the cloud that executes your microservices, and then uh, Fermion Cloud, which is our recent offering, which is really just a hosted version of Fermion Platform. But today, what we're going to talk about is Fermion Platform, running it on DigitalOcean, and then using Spin to build an application that way. So the big things about the Fermion platform, what Fermion platform provides is it provides a server-side environment for running WebAssembly modules that were built using the SPIN framework. So SPIN you use for that kind of developer-friendly, get going, get up and running, build your application experience. Uh, so it's clearly oriented toward the developer. And then the platform layers on things like version management and the ability to deploy and, and an easy to use user interface to see what's going on, and also the scheduling. So when you roll out Fermion platform, you'll have one or more worker nodes out there, and we use Nomad to schedule WebAssembly modules to be moved out there. If, you, if you're unfamiliar with Nomad, it's HashiCorp's orchestrator. It's similar in theory to something like Kubernetes, but it's much more generic and allowed us to slot in WebAssembly alongside containers and other kinds of workloads. So how do you uh, deploy Fermion platform to, to DigitalOcean? Uh, well, <laughs> it's pretty easy. Uh, if you go to github.com slash Fermion slash installer, uh, there's, an, there's a project there with a Terraform installer. You can uh, clone that CD into the DigitalOcean repo and type Terraform apply and have that stand up for you. A brand new shiny Fermion platform running inside of a DigitalOcean. Right now it uses just one droplet. When I installed this yesterday, it was about seven minutes to go from uh, to get everything up and running. And, and then I had an endpoint that I could hit and point my spin application at it. So let's take a look then. Once we've got Fermion platform installed and running inside of DigitalOcean, what does it take to build an application? I'm going to start this little video here and kick it over into full screen. So there I've got on my browser window, I have uh, Fermion platform. Now in my console, I'm going to type spin templates list. That shows me uh, the quick starts for what I can build. So I'm going to build an HTTP Go application here. 
So I type in spin new HTTP go, and then I give it a name. I'm going to call it my deploy and hit enter. And that's going to prompt me for a description. I'm just going to do hello do deploy. Uh, then I'm going to accept the defaults for the routing stuff. And then I'm going to take a look at what it created for me. So if I look in this my deploy directory, I see a basic go project and a spin.toml. So let's edit that main.go file. I'm opening VS code. I'm going to go to the main.go. Uh, it's scaffolded out. And this is what spin new does. It just scaffolds out a sort of empty project for me. I'm going to change it from hello Fermion to hello digital ocean deploy. It's about 18 lines of code here. I'm going to fix that typo. OK, uh, then I'm going to save this, and I'm just going to close the editor. I don't need it anymore. So now I'm going to go back to spin, and I'm going to type spin build, which wraps the compiler for WebAssembly. In this case, it's the TinyGo compiler in Rust. It's just Rust C. Uh, C Sharp has the .NET stack. All right, that's all it took. It's compiled. There I can see I've got main.wasm. It's about 208K. So now I want to deploy it. All right, I've built something. I've edited it. Now it's time to deploy. So I type spin deploy. This is going to push it out to the Fermion platform instance that I created in the, in the earlier step. So first, it's going to package up the WASM module, all the supporting files, the spin.toml. Uh, it's going to push those up to the API server, uh, the, the Fermion platform API server, which is going to uh, un, uh, you know, direct it into um, Nomad, and it's going to start rolling this out. So there we go. Uh, the dashboard is up. I can see I've got some log messages coming in, no environment variables or anything like that. I'm just waiting for the networking layer to stand up and looks like networking is now up. So I can click on that and I've got hello digital ocean deploy. So really in about 66 seconds here, I went from a blinking cursor to a deployed application inside of Fermion platform running in digital ocean. I'm going to delete that application. I'm back to where I started. So that is how easy it is to create an application in WebAssembly that really follows that sort of function as a service pattern. Now, what I wanted to end with today was to look at the numbers behind this, because where I think uh, WebAssembly provides us with a great serverless developer experience, right? But it also has some great benefits when it comes to cost of cloud. So uh, in May of last year, in 2021, uh, Andreessen Horowitz's blog, they published this fantastic, like, must-read blog post called The Cost of Cloud, A Trillion Dollar Paradox. And in it, they analyzed how, how organizations began spending more and more and more on cloud until really cloud is exceedingly costly. I love this quote in the article where they say, across 50 of the top public software companies that are currently utilizing cloud infrastructure, an estimated $100 billion dollars of market value is being lost among them due to cloud impact on margins relative to running the infrastructure themselves. Uh, and you can kind of get this graph over here on the side. The blue is what it would cost to run on-prem. The, the, the orange lines that you see increasing year over year, that's the cost of cloud. And they're pointing out that at this point, uh, organizations are spending, especially the top 50, are spending so much on cloud that it's actually, uh, you know, removing $100 billion of market value compared to if they had been running it on-prem. Now, Andreessen Horowitz goes on to say, OK, so what we should do is we should start moving people back into data in, into their own self-managed data centers. But as I looked at this, I thought, well, actually, there's another lesson we could learn here, which is why are we spending so much on this? Is there a way that we can start reducing that spending? And maybe the problem isn't uh, the, you know, the, the per CPU unit or whatever cost of cloud, it's the design patterns that we've bought into and that we're using that is actually driving the cost up. So what if the solution is just to think more about the kinds of patterns we're using and use different ones? So, you know, we've got this serverless way of executing WebAssembly, right? And we can contrast this with sort of the Kubernetes model. Right. In the Kubernetes model, I write a 100-line microservice. Uh, I build, build a Docker container that encapsulates this. And then I build some YAML files, deploy it out to Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is going to run between you know, 3, 5, maybe 7, 9 on the upper ends instances of my application. Now, what's the runtime profile of these? Well, they're running all the time. They're consuming resources all the time. When I figure out how many to provision, I provision for peak load. In other words, you know, if I'm worried about a big hacker news, you know, day where, where a bunch of people come in to read my blog, or I'm worried about Black Friday where a bunch of people come in to shop or something like that, then I need to plan for the peak load, not the minimal load. And so I'm running, uh, you know, I've over-provisioned essentially. 
Now, that's expensive because then I've got a lot of things running that on an average day, I'm not really using at all. At an average moment, I might not even be using it. Now, we can contrast this with the WebAssembly model and go, wait a minute. Now, if WebAssembly is really so fast that I can start it up and get to first user instruction in under a millisecond, there is no point in running WebAssembly modules over the long term. If I'm writing stateless microservices and serverless style functions, then I should shut them down all the time because I can start, run to completion and stop this uh, in, in, in milliseconds and not incur the long cost of running over a long period of, term, of time. Now, we also wanna make sure that we have redundancy as well. So uh, we wanna make sure that we're replicating this code out, but replication doesn't necessarily mean that we need to run it, right? So in the Kubernetes model, we might scale out to three, five, seven, nine, whatever. And those are all running on all of these clones in the cluster but we don't need to keep them running just to distribute them out. And so really we should be able to solve what's called the scale to zero problem, which goes something like this. When no load is coming in, I'm not running any workloads to address, right? But as load starts to build up, then I start scaling up my, my instances in order to handle all the way up to tens of thousands of instances of this kind of traffic coming in. We wanted to build something to show how this worked. And of course, you know, we wanted to build something sort of lighthearted and fun. So we built a game. It's called Finicky Whiskers. Uh, the idea of the game is Slats the cat, the little black cat there, is constantly changing her mind about what she wants to eat. Right now she wants veggies. So if you're playing the game, you click the veggies button as many times as you can before she changes her mind and wants fish. Then you're pressing the fish button or the beef button or whatever it is that she wants at that time. Now behind the scenes, we wrote nine different WebAssembly modules and we had one containerized version of Redis. And those together were running so that each time you're pressing the button, you are actually creating a new instance of a server, a WebAssembly service on the cloud. It's executing, running to completion and shutting down. So the faster you can click on the buttons, the more load you're generating, which is why we call Finicky Whiskers the world's most adorable manual load generator, because the faster you play the game, the more CPU, the more memory that you're consuming on our services, right? So we wanted to see as we built this game, does it live up to the promise of WebAssembly, right? Is it the case that we can run lots and lots of load on fairly spelled service configurations? So we created a Nomad cluster. Uh, we ran three worker nodes, all of which are small instance sizes. Uh, and, and we put this game out there and then we started observing what happened under load. And this graph here, the CPU graph, uh, kind of shows you what's going on. You can see lots of little spikes there. Those are people individually clicking on the buttons, you know, fish, 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 chicken, chicken, chicken. And we see just little spikes as a WebAssembly, for each click, a WebAssembly module comes into existence, handles the request and shuts back down. Occasionally, when you load the game, it's actually going to start out around 50 concurrent requests. And, and so we spin up 50 copies of the service deliver each file one off each instance and then shut all 50 back down. So you see some little spikes in there. When multiple people are doing that at the same time, you start to see the spikes get a little bigger. So likely that big spike in the middle is probably three people all starting the game at around the same time. So around 150 instances of WebAssembly modules that all just spun up and shut down. But you can see even on small instance sizes, very, very modest CPU usage. And if I were to show the memory graph on here, it would be very similar, very, very modest. In fact, the memory one is almost boring because it's fairly linear. Um, you, you don't even see really spikes like this on there. Uh, so that's really, uh, What's exciting about the numbers is that as we've rolled out, even Fermion Cloud, where we're now running hundreds of applications on the same uh, server instances, we're still seeing that same kind of profile. We can pack, instead of 40 containers into a very large VM size, we can pack in 900 or more WebAssembly applications in much, much smaller uh, uh, virtual machine instance size. So with that, uh, you want to learn more about the kind of core technology, Fermion.com is the place to go. You can learn about Spin, uh, Fermion Platform, Fermion Cloud. You can play the Finicky Whiskers game and help us generate some load by going to finickywhiskers.com. If you really want to dive in and start coding, developer.fermion.com is for you. And if you want to install it straight into DigitalOcean right now, github.com slash fermion slash installer is where you go. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, so there's a question in there about uh, about serverless mobile applications and peer to peer. Um, we have focused primarily on what it looks like on the uh, on the service side. Uh, so in that case, we've focused really our efforts on on running these things inside of the cloud and then providing very quick uh, responses that way. 
However, the, the cool thing about WebAssembly, and I think what this question is really tapping into is if you can run it in the browser and you can run it on the server and you can run it in constrained devices and things like that, the sky's the limit about how we begin to architect applications over time. So for example, uh, I am told that Amazon, Disney Plus, and the BBC all use WebAssembly in their players, right? The, so if you subscribe to any of those services, you got a Roku or you got a smart TV or you got an Apple TV or something, I'm told that uh, it's the same core WebAssembly logic that gets deployed out to all those IoT devices. So you've got areas like IoT, you've got areas like browser, and you've got areas like server and cloud and edge like we're doing. Uh, and the same binary format can run in all of those places. I think as the standards and specifications mature and as these technologies take off, we'll start to see an increase in being able to actually share the same binaries and even the same libraries across these different platforms. That's going to be really exciting. One of the benefits of WebAssembly is that the same binary format can run on different architectures, different operating systems. And we're not talking just the big two or three. We're talking down to specialty operating systems, embedded RTOS, um, and then things like that. So it's very exciting. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, I'm checking here. I don't see any other questions in the in the uh, in the chat, but of course I'll be hanging around in the Discord uh, for you know, for for the rest of time probably. <laughs> but definitely I'll be paying more attention this afternoon to it. Uh, thank you very much. As you can tell, we are just very excited about what WebAssembly is and what it can do. And I think this next wave of cloud computing, we really are going to see WebAssembly sitting side by side with containers and uh, and with virtual machines as a new kind of compute that's going to enable us to do some of these kind of high performance workloads much more efficiently. Ultimately, what I hope is that we really can realize reducing the cost of cloud expenses over time. With that, thanks a lot. Oh, there is one more.